Praise the Lord. We're here and live, live at Rescue Church. All right. So we're continuing on our series with healing. And tonight we're going to be speaking about the conscience. I think the Bible speaks of the conscience at least 30 times. Like I think you'll find it 30 to 32 times roughly in the New King James. And uh, so, yeah, so that's, it's there, and it's important. And um, so it, it explicitly says it that many times. But there's stories all through the Bible where God is appealing to the conscience of his people. In, in the Old Testament, the prophets were like the conscience of the nation. And in the New Covenant, the church is the conscience of the society. And so if the church goes down, then the society goes down and so we if our conscience isn't clear our voice won't be heard so this is something that we have to really uh, guard and be aware of all right your conscience matters you can't control what is going on around you but you have a responsibility to control what is going on inside of you and that is your responsibility now this is C.S. Lewis. I don't know if you know who he is. He's a famous Christian writer. This is what he says. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Most of us, when we came to Jesus, it was because we were in pain. And that is how God uses pain to draw us to a healer, to a savior, and to himself. So that's just how it works. Now, when God calls, pick up. <laughs> this is very important because I, I don't know if you've ever, someone's ever called you, and before you answer it, you're, you're, you're weighing, is this a good time to answer <laughs> this person? Because you know on the other end of this call, there's a situation. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Never. I experience that quite frequently. <laughs> and, um, Daily. yeah. And so you have to really count the cost, right? But when God calls, I just want to encourage you this is a no brainer. Pick up. Pick up. Now, God appeals to your conscience. I'm going to give you three biblical examples. Um, when Nathan confronted King David with a parable, I don't know if you guys remember that. We spoke about that recently. King David committed adultery, took a dude's wife, sent the husband to get killed. Not a very nice move. And so Nathan confronts him privately with a parable, and the wisdom in the parable conceals the situation. It activates David's conscience and his sense of justice. And Nathan goes, you're the guy that took the, the poor guy's sheep. And then judgment was pronounced on him. And even though he confessed and even though he repented, there were still consequences. So anyone who tells you there's no consequences being dishonest with you. Um, when Solomon was judging between the two women with a dead baby, you guys remember that? Yep. Yeah. He said, um, he, what he did is he said something to stir the conscience of the mother because the mother who had a living child would rather someone else raise her child than have the child cut in half. The so he, activated. yeah, so he activated, he triggered her conscience. So this is, a, this is a very important principle because God cries out to us, to our conscience. He makes us aware of something and then he prods us and nods us and knocks and and he, and he tries to get our attention so that we'll, we'll pay attention. I'll give you one more, and then we're going to be done. When Jesus was appealing to the crowd who wanted to stone the woman caught in adultery, do you remember that? That's what I got. He, um, good. We're unified, so we didn't <laughs> talk about that. He basically said, he who's sinless cast the first stone. And within that story in the book of Leviticus, you were not supposed to just stone the man. You were, uh, excuse me. You were not just supposed to stone the woman caught in adultery. You're supposed to stone the man. And so what they were doing is they were trying to catch him 
violating Jewish law and Roman law so unanimously he could be killed. So that it was a real ploy. And he had the wisdom of God and he appealed to the conscience of the crowd, not to the conscience of the people that wanted to condemn him. That's another story. But he, he said, okay, you want a stoner? No problem. Whoever is sinless, throw the first stone. And then the scripture basically says that conviction hit them and their conscience were like, no. And so what did they do? They put down the stones. So when God tries to get our attention, when God is trying to get us to see something with clarity, he appeals to our conscience. Okay? Now, what I want to do before I ask these guys questions is I want to keep this really, really simple because I think sometimes we religify stuff and we make it more complex than it is. And so if we're talking about your conscience, let's say... There's a yes, there's a no, and then there's a now, like do it now, and then there's like this is God, but it's not now. And that's one of the ones that is, it takes maturity to figure out. It's kind of easy to go yes when something, when the writing's on the wall. No is sometimes even a little more difficult because sometimes you're saying no to something good, but it's not God. And there's other times where you're saying, Yes, but not now, and you have to wait. So, if we go over one, one is yes. Your you, your conscience should give you a very clear yes when something is of God. You should have peace with that yes. Your mind needs to be renewed so you can prove and do the will of God. That's number one. Two for no. No is simple but often difficult. Sometimes you just need to make the hard choice, even if it's hard. Difficult is the way that leads to life. I'm just going to say this to you just in simplicity. The, the most important things that you'll do in your life generally are difficult. They're difficult. And you have to make peace with that you're going to have to do difficult things. You're going to have to go difficult places. You're going to have to deal with difficult people. And the, the, the way sometimes is actually going to be difficult. Following Jesus, that, that is actually the truth. And so if people are not saying that to you, they're withholding a portion of the truth from you, which is not really fair or honest or true. Because half a truth isn't the truth, it's a lie. Okay, number three, now or wait. Your conscience tells you when it's time to act. Sometimes it's God, but it's not now. Learn how to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. He knows God's timing. Remember, delay and patience are not the same thing. Sometimes in your walk, as, as important as it is to wait, on the flip side of that same coin, it's that important to act now. So you really need the Holy Spirit to show you, and you have to develop a sensitivity to the Spirit so that when He pushes on your conscience, you move. So what I want to kind of get at with uh, these guys tonight is, I'll start with Brett. When God is, is putting something on your conscience, right, whether it's a yes or no, what goes on in your heart, in your mind, in your thoughts? What is it that you feel on the inside? We're trying to, we're trying to tonight be like practitioners. Like, what is it that you feel when you're clearly knowing God is getting at your conscience? <clears throat> well, you know, in, in regards to this question, I would say, I want to just give, just say a little something yeah. before that. Before. So I think it's, you know, he's talking about your, con your conscience, so how do you respond to God? So the first thing I think about before conscience, I think about response time. And years ago, my response time was much slower. And usually if you're slow to respond, then you're not really in line with God. You're, you're double-minded, and you're, you're debating your, 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 le your, your left foot in the left lane is probably going to overpower your right because you already thought about it a little bit too long. So I'd say now coming to the current state um, through years of cleaning your conscience, but I think you're going to get into that. Uh, healing, uh, going through things, cutting things out, saying no to a lot of things that were part of your life and ingrained into your life, 
now when God puts something in my mind and in my heart, it's like an immediate download. So when it's immediate, I mean, it comes in like faster than Jackie Joyner Kersey, if anybody knows who that is, like rocket speed. So when it comes into your mind, it hits your heart first, okay? And then it's, like, it's your chance, it, that's when you need to respond. So typically when that gets downloaded, it, it, it immediately, I know it's God, it's, it's God in me because I want what God, what God wants for me and I want, I want to fulfill God's, what God's purpose for my life. That's awesome. Let me just say something real quick on uh, response time. Recently there was something on Instagram, it was a write-up that billionaires um, respond a lot faster to text messages than common people. And what he's saying is, is very, very true spiritually. But let me say one thing to you. If something is true spiritually, it's also true naturally because all truth is God's truth. And so if you have clarity in your heart about something and you know it's God, respond. And respond quick if you know it's Him. Respond. Go ahead. So... Your, 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 we went forward to screen, but your yes, your yes, your no, wait, not now. Wait, not now is not bad. Okay, that can be very good, but it takes spiritual maturity and a mature relationship with the Lord to know when something is being fulfilled, what is being prepared. Okay, you can spend years doing, we'll take your career something in your career and you're like, geez, I only care about the Lord. I only want to do kingdom work. Why am I even doing this? But what God is doing is working on your, in, in the background and preparing things. So when things start aligning down the road, years down the road, things start coming in that you know and you're mature in your connection with God, your relationship with God, Right? That that can only be God because it's humanly almost impossible. So the reaction time with me, if it's yes, I point it out to my wife, Mary, that was the Lord. And then the tears start flowing down because she knows that was confirmation. No can be very difficult. It's difficult the more when you're double-minded. It's not as difficult That's right. when you've been through pain and you know that the Lord is looking out for you. Yep. The Lord is not out to hurt you. We can hurt ourselves. <laughs> the Lord is not a punisher. Yep. No matter when things go badly, it's not the Lord's fault, right? I hear that whole thing like, oh, Lord wants to punish me. Lord wants to punish me. No, the Lord's not really into punishing, right? Now, there could be correction, but we're talking about consciousness today. So no, if it comes out quick, that's probably your best response and your strongest response that you can have to really protect God in your home, as a cornerstone in your home, in relationships. You're in relationship, you're not in relationship, so that you can stay whole and pure and walking in alignment to, to receive the most that God has for you so that you can enable to grow and not, you know, shoot yourself in the foot like, you know, some, some people could do. Yeah, also, look, one of the things he mentioned is about relationship. And I, I want to also encourage you, too, to be in relationship with people that will also help protect your conscience. Like, you, you want to be around people that value truth, that value boundaries, that value integrity, that value that stuff. Like, that's a critical point in, like, if you damage your conscience, you're actually damaging your, your humanity. And mm. it's really not a good thing, like, which we're going to get to that in, in a minute. So let me, let me go to you, Joseph. What, like, and you have a very sensitive conscience. Both of you, that's why they're actually here. Uh, they, they're very sensitive in terms of their conscience and wanting to walk before the Lord with purity and if let's say they fumble something that is admitted is not like 
you don't see it on TV. Like there, these are two guys that will will just be like, hey, like, and that's that's a big, that's a high. It it takes a high level of integrity to admit that you did something when no one knows that you did it because you want to have a clear conscience before the Lord and you don't want to walk in shame, which I have a high level of respect for them in, in that area. And this is something that also, too, because some of us come from the world and really, the world, we really have to protect our conscience because it, it can be very detrimental to the people we love if we don't protect our conscience. Um, and so, Joseph, like, how do you feel in, in like, what goes through your heart, your mind? What do you feel maybe even physically when there's something on your conscience and you know you, you either need to say something or you need to do something? What yeah. what goes on in your heart and mind? I'm trying to get that out because <clears throat> to be a practitioner, you have to understand what's going on within you. Yeah, I, I almost get disturbed. Excellent. So it's different because Excellent. when your conscience... So, like, there, there's a difference between tormented in your conscience and being disturbed in your conscience. I get disturbed, when, and that's when I know it's God. Because I can't, I can't do nothing else. I can't think about nothing else. I can't give my attention to anything else. Yeah. I'm, like, I, I'm, a, I'm almost like a hot mess be, until I know, like, until I, until I do what God is, is expecting me to do. It could be practical. It could be something in the marketplace. It could be something natural. Prime example, one day I was driving a car, I dropped Josiah off from school, I'm driving back, and there's a garbage car, garbage truck in front of me. And the guy's taking really long, throwing out all the garbage, so he tells me to go around. And I'm not really the best driver. And I went around, and my, my, my mirror clipped the other person's mirror. So I go, and I'm like, dang, and I pull over. And then the garbage guy's like, go. Just like, he looked at it, he's like, go, go, go. So I go home, and I'm like, I'm disturbed. I'm like, I got to go back. Like, this ain't worth my integrity. So I got to go back. I had to go back. I had to, like, look at it with my, from my own eyes to have peace. Or else I would have been disturbed and been a hot mess. So that's, like, a real practical example of, like, your conscience, right? Because then, like, you know, it could, be, it could seem real light, something really, like, not a big deal. But it's those little things. If you, if you, yes. if you, don't, if you don't deal with those little things, you're just, you're just making room for the bigger things later on. So for me, personally, I get like disturbed. I get like, I can't, I'm a hot mess. I, I act all weird and crazy because and, I drive myself nuts with, with stuff like that. Like I really do. And, and I know that, the, I know God is, really wants me to, you know, Brett says he responds right away. And that's the way you probably should respond right away. But I get disturbed. That's how like I really know it's him. It's beautiful. Honestly, yeah. I really appreciate that. That's yeah. like, there was something I was looking for. Yeah, I get, that, I get this. I can't, I can't move on. That's, I can't. That's, that's exactly. Yeah, and then I can't, I can't. With stuff like that, I can't walk before God. Like, like you know, you, it's, it's very similar to shame, right? Cause I can't, I can't walk with confidence because you know I gave, I gave room in a little area. You know, so I don't want to move ahead, but you know, it's, it's the, it's the truth. I can't. It's like that, that type of stuff is like. It interferes with, with my walk. Yeah. And then, let me give you a visual of what he's saying and maybe what he feels, because I've felt this many times in my life. You know when you get to, let's say, the tunnel, you get ready to go into the Lincoln Tunnel? There's a, there's a part where you get so close to the Lincoln Tunnel that you have nowhere else to go. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been there. Like, it would be not a smart idea to make a new turn. Um, you have all the police there, you have like all the cameras there, and it's really just one way to go, and it's true. And when the Lord starts to put something on you like that, that's, that's a visual of, okay, we need to go through this, we need to not try to evade this, or try to go around this, or pretend like it doesn't exist, because you're going to get pulled over, and you're going to get a huge ticket. And, you know. and so, I, I really appreciate you saying, uh, disturbed because that's actually a good word and, and this is what David said David said I thought of God and I was troubled um, and so it, Elijah the prophet was called the troubler of Israel mm. and 
if you don't feel a sense of dis disturb, being disturbed or being troubled, you may not move and things may not change. So that that sense of feeling like, okay, like I, that's important to know when that is from the Lord and it's time to then move out on what he's putting in your heart. You have something more to say on that? I'm, and then I'll stop doing this, I promise you. I'm sorry, Joe. All right. But <clears throat> he triggered me. So <laughs> Joe, so Joe mentioned that he got he gets disturbed. I'm going to give you a prime example. It almost is like it, it could be like a part of like the story of Nathan, but a little bit different. How if your conscious if your if your if your consciousness is aligned with God, God will download something into your heart for someone else. And this is going back two years ago. I'm not going to mention names because. They do watch the videos. Um, someone who was going through deep pain, I had no idea who they were. I was literally feeling Brett that day. I was going to do Brett 2.0, and I was going to go do my thing, and I was on a time schedule. I walked past this gentleman. I met him one time, hi and goodbye. Walked right past him. I felt it as I was approaching him, this pain in my stomach. Like, like a disturbed, but almost like sick. Yep. Because God knew that Brett was going to try to do Brett and not God that day because Brett was in a rush. I walked, if he's the pillar, I walked. The pain got so great, three feet after the pillar, I turned around. I really don't know this person. I woke up to him. I said, hey, I remember you with the seekers. Listen, I really felt nauseous. I was so sick to my stomach. And I just paused and God unloaded very personal information that only God would know in this person's life. I unleashed it on him. I apologized. And he just broke crying. All right? We spent 10 minutes praying together. It turned into a six-person prayer circle from born-again folks in that gym that I didn't even know, in the middle of that gym praying. This gentleman, to this day, got very close with the Lord. I just found out last night from Patrick, he's one of our biggest donors, and this guy was like scraping pennies together for GRHI. That's not the important part, but the whole point is, do you see what God's purpose is? If, if you can respond to that consciousness, whether it's you're disturbed, the best thing you can do is, is to go with it. If you don't fight it, because if it's for someone else, none of that would have happened. So. That's beautiful. So it could be a ministry opportunity, like Brett said, or it could be something the Lord wants you to do for you. That is about you rectifying something, repenting, confessing, or maybe blessing someone. Whatever it may be, when you know it's the Lord, yeah. go with it. Now, you had something, because we selected the same passage by accident. Yeah. I, but it wasn't by accident. You have something you want to share from that? Well, is that something you want to do? Well, I got a few things, but Let's that's go. that's one of the things. So in, in Romans 9, 1 through 3, it says... Um, our conscience bears witness in the Holy Ghost. So one of the things about our conscience is that it, it bears witness. So that's, we, have to, we have to be mindful of that. In Romans 2, 14 through 15, this is when he was talking about the, the Gentiles, but specifically uh, show the work of the law written on their hearts. So the, so the law of God was written on their hearts. Their conscience also bears witness in their thoughts. I want you to pay attention to this right here. Their thoughts accusing that's to charge or to be a plaintiff or excusing so think about you know the courtroom think about the courtroom your conscience is bears witness your your conscience can be the accuser that's right or or your conscience can be the one that excuses you uh -oh. right so so the word excusing is is ex Exculpate. It means to show or declare someone not guilty of wrongdoing. So, so your conscience, so how we respond, how we respond 
will, will either incriminate us <laughs> or set us free. So, so our, the, the witness is, is our conscience. Our conscience bears witness to, to our hearts, and, and, and it usually comes through the Holy Ghost, right? So we have to be mindful and pay attention to those things, and I think that that was something when I was reading and just going through the things pertaining to the conscience, I thought that was something that we should talk about because I thought it was good. Very good. But in the, the story of the woman that was taken in adultery, I thought it was interesting because she was, she was taken in the act. Which is like, you wonder how those guys got there, right? Yeah. But um, that's another story. <laughs> I didn't know where she yeah. was. But yeah, so, so when, they set, when they set her in his midst, they said, Master, this woman was taken in the very act of adultery. Now, Moses, now they're trying to, they're trying to get, jam Jesus up here. Now, the law commanded us that, that uh, such should be stoned. But what do you say? So, you know, after that, Jesus starts playing in the dirt. Like, he totally ignores them. He's, like, playing in the dirt. Then they keep on asking him. He's like... You know, just not really responding the way they, they think he should respond, which is, which is Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> so, when Jesus. So when they kept asking Jesus about the, the matter, he said, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And then he goes and he starts playing in the dirt again, like, you know, that, giving him some time to ponder. So when, he, when, he's saying, when he's saying that, What's happening right, right now, you have the Word of God, because Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. You're having the Word of God spoken, and it's convicting, in our, it's convicting their hearts. Because what, what, what that is doing is getting to the root and the motive of why they're even asking a question. So then what happens? You know, there, it says, they which heard it, being convicted in their own conscience, went out one by one. So, so exactly what I was talking to you about before, about, you know, it could be, you know, the one that accuses you or the one that excuses you. They, they realize, I have a lot of sin. <laughs> so let me put this stone down and let me go away. And that's what happens. So I think sometimes in, in, in life, when we're sensitive to the Word of God, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, the Holy Spirit has given us um, an option. And, and a lot of times the, the option is either... You know, do you want to get accused of this <laughs> or do you want to get excused of this? I'd rather be excused. Yeah. And the only one with no sin doesn't like to throw stones. <laughs> yeah. So that's another story. Interesting stuff. how that works out, right? Yeah. But, um, yeah, so that, that was that. And then um, I have a few questions, too. But um, we right. could, we could. Um, what are your. Uh... So my question is, how do, how do we keep our conscience clean? How do we keep our conscience clean? We're going to get into that. One is do what you know to do is right. I want to say something that there's no shortcut. Like there, there, there's no there's no there's no supplement that supplements obedience. It's it, there's no amount of money you can give. There's no amount of mission trips you can do. There's no amount of there's nothing that you can do that replaces simple obedience. And, and let me say something to us as a culture. As a culture, it's only been in the last 20 or 30 years where, oh, I don't feel it, or I wasn't feeling it, has even became a valid excuse. But to God, that's not a valid excuse. Do you think Jesus felt like being ripped apart on a tree? I mean, you just got to use your common sense. Like, so when we're like, well, you know, I was just tired. Welcome to being an adult. Like, what does that even mean? I was tired. Like, who's not? Find someone who's not tired. I, I, did, I didn't feel like it. Well, I mean, that's okay, but we're not asking how you feel. We're talking about what did you do? And so this idea of that, oh, I didn't feel it or I wasn't feeling it or I don't believe that, well, what does the Bible say? So there's no replacement for simple obedience. So there's no way that I can have a clear conscience if I don't have a clean life. This just, is just not possible. This is why the world is mentally ill because the world is trying to shut their conscience off, but their conscience is what makes them human. So they're having a fight with themselves. So no wonder you're mentally ill. You're so double-minded that you are mentally ill. 
And there's no solution, so what do they do? They medicate. But all that does is numb their person and their consciousness and their conscience, and it destroys and damages their humanity. It, it's, it, it destroys their relationships. M overly medicated people generally are either really skinny or super fat. There's nothing good that comes from trying to numb yourself, whether it's with pills, alcohol, coke, materialism, sex, the refrigerator, whatever it is, you're actually damaging the most important part of your life and the only part of your life that can clearly perceive what God wants from you and then live in the pleasure of knowing you did what God wants and then you let the results fall where they may. When Paul was writing to the churches, he said, I have a clean conscience towards God for you. And, you know, that is so important. Now, let's just say we fall short of God's glory. You know, we respond, um, you know, in a way that's not Christ-like or not kind. It happens to all of us. This is where you humble yourself and say, hey, you know, guys, I was, you know, I came at you, you know, a little bit aggressive. I apologize for that. Or, hey, I was rude. Please forgive me. And so when we confess, that's cleansing the conscience. Now, this is, there's biblical language, which I'm actually going to get into in a minute, actually, because this is really important. Um, the biblical language in Hebrews is that the conscience has been sprinkled with the blood of the Lamb. So wherever, whatever the blood touches, it cleanses. Okay? So that's, that's one thing. But in 1 Peter 3.21, I can have a clean conscience or a clear conscience because of the resurrection. So you have to know how valuable is this. The blood that was shed, right? And the empty tomb. So that means that a clear conscience is absolutely central to the new covenant because it was impossible in the old covenant. And that language is all in Hebrews when it talks about even the priest who made atonement for the people. He couldn't have his own conscience cleansed. But we can in Christ through the blood of sprinkling. And so when you determine how valuable something is, the, you, we know how valuable something is based upon what someone will pay for it. You may say, well, I feel that it's worth $2 million. But if no one will pay you $2 million, it doesn't matter what you feel. It matters what someone's willing to pay. And, and someone could be willing to pay $10,000 for something that's only worth five. But that's how capitalism works. It works that if someone wants to pay 10000 because they want it that bad, they can pay 10000 and they can get what's being sold. So when you look at your conscience, right, you're talking about who paid for that to be cleansed who paid for that to be clean? Jesus. What was the price? His blood and, and the resurrection. So that means that it is central to the gospel. It's part of your eternal life now. Having a clear conscience toward God. Like in, in the kingdom in heaven, everyone has a clear conscience toward God. Christ is the central figure. He is, the, and everything is focused on him. And so you have to, when we're talking about conscience, you have, we're not just talking about like, how do you feel about your choices in life? How do you feel about your career? I'm not talking about that. We're talking about something way deeper and way more expensive and way more valuable. We're talking about the part of your humanity that is able to clearly grasp what does the eternal God actually want from you in real life and the power to properly respond to God if you keep your conscience clear and you manage that. That's critical. That, that is central to eternity. That is central to your reward in eternity. That is central to your, your, your life now. It's also central to the people that love you the most, what they'll experience about you. If you damage your conscience, you will probably damage the conscience of those you are responsible for. So you, you have to think about that the best way to protect everything that you have is in here. And this is what everyone doesn't value. The other day I was praying and the Lord said, if, if you concern yourself with the inside and I will concern myself about your outside. So don't focus on the, out, the outward things. Don't focus on them. 
Focus on the inward things because that's what you're responsible for. And um, so a conscience that is clear toward God, here's an example in scripture. It says, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight of God. That is the desire to live with a clear conscience. That, how do you know it's clear? Because what God sees about it and what God says about it is good. Amen. That person can sleep at night. That person doesn't go to sleep angry. That person lives in the joy of the Lord even when circumstances are not worth smiling about. And this is the prayer of David. Another thing that can happen to the conscience in 1 Timothy 4 is the conscience can be seared with a hot iron. I remember in my life, I, I, went, I, was, in, I was in a point in my life where I didn't have remorse for human life. And I realized that if I continue this way, this is not going to be good. And so, like, you want to really protect your conscience because if you shut it off and you shut it down, you can really damage yourself and damage other people. Um, in Titus 1, it talks about a conscience that is defiled. Um, Many times when we're talking about defiled, we're talking about sexual immorality. So that's something that you have to really watch what you see. Like, so you probably shouldn't be looking at porn. Or if you're watching a show and something comes on, maybe you should turn your face to fast forward. Whatever it is, you have to be sensitive to the Lord. Recently I was watching a show and there was too much sex in the show, and I said, I'm not watching this show because this is over the top, and I didn't sign up for that. Like, I signed up for, like, this, and this is not what I signed up for, so I'm not watching that. So you, you have to, in the spirit, be sensitive to if something isn't good for you, don't engage with it. The other day, oh, we'll give you just a practical one. I, I, recently, I was in the, in the, in the process, we were gonna, I was going to buy a watch from a friend. And Brett and I talked about it, and there were some parameters that we set up. <laughs> now, those parameters were to protect my integrity, right? Yeah. And so we didn't buy the watch. But the point of that is, is not about a watch. The point of it is that you have to set up a structure in your life where you say, I will not go here. I will not do that. This is not, and as and like as a as a father and a husband, and you have to set that up for your family. So your family needs a corporate identity in, in the sense of we are kingdom people. This is what we do. This is how we behave. This is how we interact. This is how we handle money. This is how we treat people. These are our values. Your conscience helps you to protect the essence of who you're called to be. But many times people will sacrifice their conscience and the essence of who they're called to be to protect their image, which is something they project, not something they are. And that's why we live in a generation of people who, they, there's people they look strong, but they're not strong. There's people that look rich, but they're not rich. I would rather be stronger than I look, or richer than I look, or more solid than you think I am, than to try to project an image of something that's not real. Because in projecting that image, you're lying to people, you're sacrificing your integrity, and the worst thing you're doing is you're damaging your conscience, and if you keep damaging your conscience, you won't care about your integrity, and your integrity is essential to everything that God has for you because if you can't be trusted, you can't have more. And we will be held responsible for how we navigate what we already have, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a family, whether it's resources, whether it's relationship, whatever it is, we will be. So we're going to jump back into conscience for a second. What? Give us an example, like if you can, of when you know something is not good, like wh what's the check you get? Uh, the check is, can you 
you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So the check is immediate to me because, you know, I wasn't always this way. Uh, similar to <laughs> <laughs> listen, and it, well, it, listen it's, not, it's not like you, oh, you know, I live in, I've, I've arrived. No, it's like every day I'm trying to figure out what is inside, what's, is there something inside me, like, Lord, seek inside my heart, if there's something that doesn't belong there, or it's trying to creep their way in, this is where you got to be really, yep. quick, really careful yep. on keeping your conscience real tight. Because the second you start coming in here, the second you 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 receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, well, you, you got a target on your back. So you drop yep. your guard, you you let go of your conscience just a little bit. One slip up leads to two slip ups. Now as you're crying on the floor because you slipped up, and you just open up the back door to the devil to come in, and then all your your little ex friends, they know, oh, we got you. We're gonna come in that way. So that's number one. So I think for me is that 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 old life I don't want. It. I'm actually I'm, I personally don't even care to hurt feelings at that point. Like I'm I'm so protective over what I have and what I work towards because it costs me. I gained a lot, but I went through a lot of pain and. The first thing that gets triggered when it's when he's talking about my conscience is the first thing that goes off, because it's usually like, don't don't talk like that. Mm -hmm. Don't how you feel right now because I get tested all day long. I do not have a fun. It's not fun every day from 4 a.m. on. It's just not fun. It's like I already know what's coming. Yep. So I need to prepare, like literally before my day starts throughout my day, because. The way I'm feeling, machine gun, bullet, bad stuff could come out. So number one, it's like, be a godly person. Remember who you are, remember who you're talking to, yep. right? Remember, remember what you graduated from and where you are now, that's number one. Number two, if it's something that is like getting positioned to like, oh, like you really need to be a part of that, you know how quick I said I don't need to be a part of that? Like real fast, like it's like doesn't even get like, eh, well, weigh it out. No, no, I don't even weigh it out. It's like uh, it already knows people around me. They're like, it's like a drop dead. It's it's not gonna happen. And the reason why the first thing that comes in is the devil. I feel it's like the devil trying to give me to yep. like, come in and rob my life. And I, there's no way I, I want anything to rob my life. Yeah, and and you know who will rob my life? I'll rob my own life if yeah. I let go of my conscience and if I like oh debate it. Oh, let's do a let's do a free pass, Brad. No, there's no free pass. Yeah, let me let me say one thing because when you're saying this, I'm thinking of like how life actually happens. And let me give you an example of your conscience, how how you notice something. Let's just say you're talking to someone. You know, they're not a believer. And, and they say something to you, they give you some some foul advice, or they say some something, let's say negative about marriage, because they got slain or something, whatever it is. Well, as soon as something doesn't sit right with you, don't accept it. And say, in the name of Jesus, I don't accept that. If you need to say it out loud, you can do that. But that's really big. Even even if someone gives you a cheese doodle prophetic word, and you're like, "Nah, I don't, I don't know about all that." Like, you don't have to just accept everything from everyone. And and you, if something doesn't sit well with your conscience, don't participate with it. If if you feel, "No, I'm not, I'm not supposed to do that," don't just do something. Like right now, my, my wife and I, <laughs> we're trying to book a hotel. We're trying to book a. a what do you call it? A vacation. And we're talking here, there, here. And it's just not sitting well with me. It's not I, Croatia. Yeah, well, that's the way I said that. <laughs> and, and so we're, we're just, but we, if something doesn't sit well with you, I might just need to do that. If someone does, if something doesn't sit well with you, hmm. don't buy into it. Don't invest in it. Don't put your trust in it. Don't put your confidence in it. There's, there's a reason why 
it's not sitting well with you. The Hebrew says that your senses need to be exercised to discern. So every day when you're listening, you're listening to the filter of hopefully your renewed mind. That's why if you have a renewed mind and you listen to people who are double-minded or who are in unbelief and are afraid, it's like you don't even want to talk to them because everything they say is nonsense. Right. It's like, what is wrong with you? And it's worse when they're Christians. But you have to not take that in. So, so you have to be gracious with people and patient with people and kind to people. But that doesn't mean you have to take everything in. So if something is not sitting well with you, don't accept it. Don't accept it. Don't let someone force their fear on you force their unbelief on you, force or project their bad experiences on you, don't let people do that. You have something? I agree. <laughs> so, yeah, like, even recently, I was talking to my old man, and, and my old man was, you know, I'm the type of person, like, no matter who's talking to me, I try to see what I, I don't like just shut people down. Like I try to see like, what can I receive from this person? Like Christian or not, like some people are just knowledgeable. Like, what are you gonna shut down like a, a mechanic that's knowledgeable about mechanics because he doesn't believe in Jesus? No, you'll rob yourself if you have a car problem, right? So yep. my, my point is my, my father was recently talking to me about Haiti and really saying it like, do you really want to go? And right away when he's saying that, Number one, I know that he's my father and he loves me and he's concerned. I know that he was in the military. And I know that he thinks, uh, you know, he's right, like right, someone right. in the military, right? <laughs> so, right? And I, the first thing I do is like, you know, I, all right, dad, you know, I get it. I understand. You know, I love you. And then I have to like know that I'm not going to let his fear yeah. like, like come on me and, and, and like influence my decisions, right? I'm not going to let that live in me. But what I, what I want to do is I want to also remind him of why I'm going, who's sending me, and that everything's going to be all right. And, you know, and, 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 and Erica's not coming with the kids, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, like, so he feels a little better, you know? And, and, like, that's just, like, a little example of, like, so, you know, just, you know, sometimes you just got to, like, know, you know, what, you know, how to respond, know what, what not to receive. Sometimes you verbally got to shut somebody down and just say, hey, listen, I respect you, but I don't receive that in Jesus' name. I've done that before. And, you know, you look kind of crazy to the other people, but, you know, before God, you don't look crazy at all. You know, you're just taking your stance as a Christian and, and, and um, you know, just, you know, taking your ground. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's about it. Great. In terms of that. I yeah, mean, just guard, guard your conscience. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Protect your conscience. If, yeah. you, if you drop, if you did something crazy, just yeah. confess it. The, the confession of sins... And to don't God, wait. And don't wait. The confession of sins to God is so beautiful because He knows anyway. So when you confess it to Him, you're actually saying you're going to stop lying to yourself and stop pretending. Mercy, the Bible says that mercy is for those who confess and forsake their sin. That's another story confess and forsake it. So we know that the confession is real and sincere when someone is willing to forsake it. Because then if they forsake it, it doesn't, it doesn't have a hold on them. Let me give you another example. When you live with unforgiveness, unforgiveness is actually a stain. It is a sin. But it's a stain on your conscience because God says to forgive and you're saying no. And the person who hurt you, they hurt you probably by disobeying God and you're mad at them and you're doing the same thing they're doing, disobeying God. And to hold unforgiveness toward them doesn't mean they can't go free, it means you can't go free. So unforgiveness is something that not only... It, it, it damages your conscience and it numbs you and you don't get to experience the beauty of life the, the way God designed life to be and the life that he wants to give you because you're shutting yourself down from his forgiveness because you're unwilling to forgive so you can walk in condemnation 
You can walk in shame. You can walk in what they did to you, what they said about you. Instead of choosing to believe what God says about you, instead of letting it go, so it lets you go, and then your conscience is cleansed. Now, your conscience is defiled, and the Bible says to the pure, everything is pure, but to and to the upright, everything is upright. But to the you know to, to the person who is a like it even says in Proverbs that if you're a fraud, God will show Himself to be a fraud to you. So your morality has a, has has a, has actually a lot to do with your theology. So that's a whole other story. I'm not going to get into that too much, but it's very important that you protect your conscience, which means confess when you've been wrong, which means set safeguards up in your life so that you do right. That's that's really important in, in your life. Like the Bible says in the multitude of counsel, there's wisdom. Like anytime you just want to go do something and you don't want to speak to wise people about it, there's probably a reason. Anytime people isolate themselves, it's because they have something to hide. Anytime someone doesn't want to be known, they don't want to be known, they want to just come in and come out, come in and go out, there's probably a reason. So what we're wanting to, the Lord to do in this season is bring healing and really go deep in the heart so that the conscience is cleansed, so that the mind is renewed, so that we can perceive the will of God so that we can partner with it and then live in the joy of knowing our life is actually pleasing to the Lord. That's, that he deserves that, but I hate to say it, but so do you. Like if Jesus died for you to have peace, then you actually deserve peace. If Jesus died for you to have joy, then you actually deserve to have joy. Jesus said, the scripture says that God became poor so that you could become rich. No one believes that. I believe that. <laughs> That's like, he was willing to pay a price so that you could be blessed. Amen. Anyone who's a father knows exactly what, what this is. You're willing to do stuff that's difficult so that they have a better life. That's what, that's what he did. Think of, think of your life. You live a better life than Jesus. I don't mean a more meaningful life. I mean a more easy life. God's own son had a much more difficult life than you and I. And so we should at least be grateful for the life that he gave us and enjoy the life that he gave us. Jesus. I mean, I don't know if you're... It's like we got adopted and we got a better life. Are, do you realize that? Yes. Paul the Apostle, you know, had to go on ships. They were shipwrecked. You're getting into you're getting in a plane and you're looking at watching movies till you get there. What's wrong with you? You think you're a little sore? So what? Like with snacks. I mean, come on, our life we, we should be really thankful. Like, doesn't doesn't your conscience kind of like prod you and say, um, excuse me, you have a lot. Hello? It's not that rough for you, buddy. You should be thankful. You should walk in the church. Because there's billions of people, like six of them, six billion people, that would trade places with you. And so we should at least be thankful. I don't know about you, but my conscience tells me, hey, do you realize what you have? You may not have everything you want, but you have a lot more than you need. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's be thankful. That's another thing. That if we're not living in gratitude, that's also damaging our conscience. Because then you have entitlement. The other thing is that you got to give room for God to work. Like if you're you're if you're very rigid and you're like in a now world, like there's so so you know there's storms, right? And there there's times that like. It might not be over right now, you know, and you're in seasons yep. and out of seasons, and how do you grow? How do you, this is not a hard one, how do you grow? Through friction, right, through challenges, through pain. Look at what Jesus went through on the cross. It's kind of yep. like forbearing and telling you, like, he died, he went through all that, 
because he, he turned into the flesh to, to become like us, right? So in order for us to go through that, yes, we have to, this isn't like promise, like, oh my gosh, I'm saved, and like, I just won the lotto, I'm just never gonna run out of money, and everyone's gonna love me, and everything's gonna be great. No, you're gonna go through a piece of almost everything that he went through. So there's also times that you have to be uh, mature in your spiritual spirituality, even if it's like really bad that you think it's really bad. It, it's not, you, you can't, you have to watch the way you're, uh, you really need to pray about it actually first. You gotta pray first. Like that's, that's kind of like the first thing I do is I pray, shut it all down, try to get a communication, you come out, and then you need to respond with God, you know? And I think part of your conscious is like hanging tight with God is a great way to respond to something. Yeah, hang in there, don't give up. Yeah. And with, with, with what he's saying about responding, you know, we don't have to respond to everything right away. I think that we live in a culture where we feel that we need to respond to everything all the time right away. And while I think it is important to respond to the things and people you are responsible for, I also don't think it's necessary to respond to everything and everyone you're not responsible for. Mm -hmm. And uh, the world will keep spinning if we don't offer our opinion where it wasn't asked for. Uh, <laughs> I promise you that. Um, yeah, so I think we're going to wrap it up here. Do you have anything else you want to say? Yeah, I got one last thing. So one of the, I got a couple of things I really want to share, but I'll just stick to one just for the sake of time. So um, one, of the, one of the saddest stories in the Bible is the, the story of Samson. Like his mom was barren. The angel of the Lord <laughs> shows up. You know, the angel of the Lord showed up and told her she was going to have a child, and the child was going to be dedicated from the time he was born to the time he dies, and that he was going to be a Nazarite, right? So, so right away from the rip, he, he had a, you know, he had a, a life that he had to, to live up to the standard. He was chosen. He was set apart by God for the purposes of God. And you see that all throughout his walk, all throughout his walk, his gifting, was the only thing he took care of. And he didn't really even do a good job with that. Right, his strength. Right, everything else, everything else was, was just reckless living. Nowhere through that passage do you ever see him repenting. You never see, you, oh, I mean, my man was drinking liquor. He, he wasn't supposed to drink liquor, right? The, the only time that he was justified for going with a Philistine was, was when he, his first wife because that was the work of the Lord behind the scenes. But really, he was laying with prostitutes. He was, he was wilding out. He was a wild boy. Never once, like his conscience was straight up seared. Never yep. once, never once did, did he repent. Yep. Never once did he repent. If he would have stood away from the wine, right? If he would have did what he was supposed to do, if he would have kept his vow, he would have been a good judge. He would have been a great judge. God didn't come down from heaven for, for no reason. He was supposed to be more than he was. Yep. Right? Yep. What, the saddest part in that whole story is when he finally, when he finally got tired of, of the nagging, he didn't learn from his first nag. Right? His second nag, he, he, like, he, you know, he went through it once. He went through it again. Like, I mean, whatever. That's another story. I don't want to get into that. But he, he, she nagged him to death, and that's what, what happened. It resulted in his death. Yep. But, but the, thing, the saddest part of that whole thing was is that he didn't know. He was so numb. His conscience was so seared that he didn't know that the presence of God left him. Yep. And that's what, that's what happens. That's what happens when we don't confess our sin before, before us and God, when we don't keep a clean conscience, when we're not a, a, aware of our walk with Him. Yep. He, could, he, could, he, could, he could bounce and you won't even know. Yep. And I think that's one of the, the, the saddest uh, verses in the entire Bible. I'm sure there's a bunch of other ones, but that one is really sad because he, he was a mighty man and he judged for 20 years. 20 years he judged. And, and even think about it, all that wild stuff, the presence of God didn't leave him. He was laying with prostitutes. The presence of God didn't leave him. He was, he was fornicating. I'm sure that wasn't the first time he was with a harlot, right? 
It's just documented. <laughs> but that time was documented, you know? But like all that time, the presence of God didn't leave him until the very end when he truly broke that vow, when he gave up what he wasn't supposed to do was cut his hair. That was like the final straw. And he left. Yep. And he went out to fight, thinking that God was there, thinking that he had his strength, and then he, and it was a wrap. Yep. And I think if we're not careful sometimes, like think, I think you could really pull from that story. If we're not careful sometimes, we could really, really, um, you know, be in such... In, walk in the flesh so much that we don't even know that the Spirit of God has departed us. You can, get, you can get to that point if you really don't confess, if you're really not sensitive with your conscience. Yeah, and whatever you don't manage, you'll lose. Yeah. He didn't manage his eyes. Yeah. That was his problem. Heathen woman. Whatever you don't manage, you'll lose. And your conscience is the thing that helps you manage what God has given you. So I, I really think that's a great example. And I think that that's a sobering example. And the Bible is full, it's filled with yeah. tragedies because that's how we learn. You learn what not to do when you see a tragedy. And so his desire for revenge costs his own life, right? That's spiritually blind, naturally blind. He just, what you don't manage to lose. So anyway, it's your job to manage your conscience the Holy Spirit will bear witness with you. He will help you. The Word of God is there to give you the boundaries and the parameters and the, the unquestionable, this is true. And, uh, you know, as brothers and sisters in the Lord, we want to support one another as we guard our heart. Because when you guard your heart, that's, that's how you protect your life. That's how you protect your future. And as you learn to navigate your conscience and, and really... Do that in the fear of the Lord. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the words that Brett and Joseph have shared tonight. Thank you for dying for us, Lord, and for sprinkling our conscience so it can be cleansed and sensitive and perceptive to your will. Thank you for the resurrection that makes our conscience clean toward you. And Lord, I ask you that by the Holy Spirit that you would give us grace and wisdom to walk in purity, to walk in the fear of the Lord, to walk in holiness, to walk in righteousness, to do justice, to understand what you require, which is to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And so, Lord, we pray that that would be our story, that we would do justice, that we would love mercy, and that we would walk humbly with you, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.